so as we'll mention, um, I teach at NYU and MIT, and actually also at the Lower East Side Girls Club in Manhattan, um, which is part of the Mozilla Hive. And um, I've learned a lot from all of these teaching experiences. Um, and I'm going to kind of share the production pipeline that, um, that I find to be very useful. Um, and then also some of the lessons learned from uh, my students as well in this whole um, intersection of the quantified self and the smart city. And so I'll talk about those areas individually and those areas together. Um, does anybody here work um, in either of those domains? Um, can interpret that broadly? Great, great, thanks. Um, um, let's see, so the um, sort of the outline for today is I'll talk a little bit about quantified self and the notion of what it is, um, how to, um, some uh, tips for accessing um, data, and then um, beyond that, tips for collecting data, so sort of building DIY sensor systems. Um, sort of from the citizen science perspective. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about smart cities and um, you know what that means to me, because both the terms quantified self and smart cities can be interpreted very broadly. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you my own definition of that. And then also tips and tools on the kinds of types um, with some examples uh, from the classes that I teach. Um, and then actually I'll break for Q&A, and if there's time, then I'll go into like a deeper case study um, with my project that we'll mention, which is called MindWriter. Okay, and um, please feel free, while I'm going uh, um, through all these sort of tips and tools, to um, ask a question at any point. Okay, we don't have to wait until the Q&A. Um, this is sort of a cooking, uh, this is a cooking track um, talk, so yeah, let's have it be interactive. Okay, great. So um, I kind of think of, um, when we think of quantified self, a lot of times we think of commercial devices that we use for fitness, right? Um, although that's starting to change um, in terms of what kind of wearables are out there, what kind of um, ways we can track ourselves are out there um, with our phones, etc. Um, I really liked um, a definition that um, one of my students this past spring in a class that I teach called the Quantified Self in the Smart City um, uh, kind of talked about with um, Quantified Self 2.0. So that the idea that you're not only tracking your own data or your friend's data, but that there is this sort of growing body of data, um, a, a personal data, but also sort of biometric data as well that is um, at the scale of the city. And so that's really um, the area in which um, I and a lot of people that I work with play with. But you know, sort of that notion of quantified self 1.0 is, um, is looking at your data over time. Kind of quantified self 2.0 is looking at many people's data over time or many people's data over space. Um, and so um, uh, uh, some of what we do in class is, um, is access um, open data sets, um, sometimes closed data sets as well. And so particularly um, since uh, uh, we're in New York, that's a very um, a great city to find a lot of data. Um, and so one thing that I find to be incredibly important is to go through that process of doing um, lit reviews, sort of best practice, you know, finding the best practices around the topic that you want to research. So, for instance, my topic is um, the mental experiences of cyclists, you know, while they're riding up and down the main streets of my city. So, you know, this I, I've come to realize that sort of doing lit review, it, you know, seems kind of like a no-brainer, but it's not. So that's a big part of the process, sort of contextualizing the work. Um, in terms of the prior art and what exists already. Um, and then I find a really um, important part of sort of building your project is developing constraints. So, um, you know, uh, if you're searching for um, open data, so this is a screenshot from, um, from NASA's um, data repository, Echo Reverb. And there are a lot of, even though it's sort of cut off at the edges, there you can see that there are a lot of ways that you can constrain your search. So you can do a spatial search, you can do a temporal search, you can search by satellite, um, you can search by, um, uh, by um, the level of the data that you acquire. Um, and uh, some of my students find that using actually um, uh, NASA data has been really useful in terms of um, bringing um, um, multi-spectral data into sort of the realm of quantified self. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. 
Um, and then in a lot of cases, for instance, um, there, uh, in New York with NYC open data, but I know with um, other cities as well, um, to, uh, there's this whole notion of, um, of acquiring data through, through queries. So if you know SQL, that's really helpful. Um, with um, NYC Soda data, uh, with NYC Open Data, there's um, a query language called uh, Soda, um, which you might be familiar with if you've um, acquired city data or other kinds of municipal um, data sets. Um, that's a little bit more on that. And then in some cases, um, not that often with um, the kind of projects that I do or the, the kind of students who are drawn to, um, to my class. And those students tend to be um, uh, urban science, urban planning, and creative and de design technologists, um, um, as well as journalists in many, case, uh, many cases, the journalists who are interested in the whole sort of field of sensor and data journalism. Um, so um, most of the students who I work with tend to use open data sets or collect their own data, but in some cases there's also an interest in, um, in scraping um, data that does not have a public API. And so um, that's an area that is sort of in this pipeline as well. Um, a lot of what I spend time on um, is um, making those sort of uh, uh, small sensors as prototyping sensor systems. Um, and so um, that, that's really more the domain of collecting data. Um, so I kind of think of it as building the instrument and deploying the instrument. Um, this is a Lego microscope, by the way, that's being built. Um, um, so though in terms of um, building an instrument, um, researchers from a lot of different fields have a different idea of what building an instrument is. So in, in um, the case of my practice, um, it's often um, prototyping a sensor instrument. But in other cases, it can be uh, putting together a survey, or it can be putting together a reporting system that people then uh, report information through. Um, these are some of the most commonly used sensors um, in, uh, in the classes that I teach, and they include um, biometric and environmental sensors. Um, so for instance, a lot of the um, sensors in the middle that have screens on them right here. Um, those are different kinds of gas sensors. Um, for instance, um, carbon dioxide, methane, et cetera. Um, there, we also have optical dust sensors that we use, vibration and wind, um, pulse, um, brain in some cases, um, skin conductance, that kind of thing. And um, a lot of my students, well, I'll get to that next, actually. <laughs> um, so in terms of building, uh, can you still hear me? OK, great. In terms of uh, building a sensor system, these are um, the components that we sort of, you, these are the choices that you have to make. Like, um, these are the components that, the, the component categories for building a kind of DIY sensor system. Um, so uh, that includes the sensor itself. It includes um, a module to process the signal from the sensor. In many cases, that's an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Um, that includes a way to power the system, um, a way to transmit the data, either um, by, through a cable or through wireless, um, a way to um, uh, process the data um, on, on the fly in some cases, but sometimes that data is sent to a central um, sort of processing center. Um, and then in many cases, there's some kind of like simple system status output. So for instance, on this microphone, I, I have this little green light here, and we often build like some kind of, you know, um, quick status indicator. Um, and then um, we go through several iterations, not just of making sure that the instrument works, but making sure that it's usable for the audience that we want to um, deploy it with. And so what I have, um, circled in green are um, all the sort of parts that you have to test for, um, for usability. And so we spend time um, doing, uh, in our classes, there's some time for, um, for user testing. Um, we also spend a lot of time on persona design. So if any of you are familiar with that, sort of, um, uh, you know, just thinking about who is the best user for this and let's actually sketch out a story for that and sketch out, you know, the process of the person using this instrument throughout the day. So for instance, a cyclist, or someone walking to work, or someone who just got home, that kind of thing. What are the questions that they're trying to answer with this instrument? Um, so now I'm going to go through some examples of each of the um, nodes in this, in this chart. 
um, and talk about um, sort of the open source options and the less open source options. And I think a lot of us in our practices um, use a combination of open source and, and free and closed source. And we try to use open source when, when we can. But in many cases in the world of hardware, that's, that's not so much an option, although that is changing. Um, so for those of you who um, tinker um, with hardware, um, some of you have some experience um, with Arduino or uh, Raspberry Pi. So those are the two sort of most popular um, processing units in the instrument, in the sensor systems that we build. I personally really like um, Arduino one because it's fully open source, but also two because um, you can really just, it's really just plug and play in terms of connecting a sensor and getting um, that system up and running. Where Arduino is, is weak is um, processing um, uh, uh, signal data on the fly um, and analyzing, it's particularly analyzing it on the fly. So for students who want to have a more robust kind of analysis on the fly, for instance, I have a set of students who, um, who are deploying instruments on vehicles to test for road bumpiness, and that data is submitted to um, the Department of Transportation. They need something more like the Raspberry Pi that can do that kind of analysis on board without being sent somewhere else. Um, and then, um, as far as transmission units are concerned, in many cases um, you have um, Bluetooth, that's what I work with the most. Um, and sometimes you have Wi Fi, they'd be that kind of thing. But you kind of have to figure out, you know, where, how far are you transmitting, and um, what is the, the sensor that makes the most sense for that. Um, I do a lot of um, sort of um, accessory type um, uh, systems um, where I uh, transmit the data off the Arduino to a phone. And so in many cases that phone acts as a storage unit. Um, here we have a phone, but then we also have um, a GSM radio to the left that will um, send a text message or um, an SD card to the, oh, the GSM is to the right, and the SD card is to the left. So it's kind of kind of thinking about where will your data be stored. Um, and then also, since if you're uh, developing sort of accessory, then the phone is also your geolocation unit. But if you're not doing that, then you also need to implement some kind of um, geolocation um, uh, component, usually GPS. Um, so this is an example of me sort of filling out this for, for, um, for a system that, that I would build. And so that is a combination of, um, of simplified brain sensors with um, a simple battery and Bluetooth, um, an Arduino a light to indicate status, and then um, all that information that's collected on the Arduino is um, transmitted um, to the phone. Um, so, so as you can see, it's sort of a mix of um, open and closed. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I, I really think that it's important to sort of think about collecting um, sensor data um, and sort of quantified self existing um, in tandem with other ways of collecting data. So for instance, collecting qualified data through, um, through surveys, through interviews, um, through um, reporting where there's not necessarily a moderator. Um, and then, you know, sort of that helps you, you to, sort of to prepare for deploying the instrument. So this is the Lego microscope in use. Um, and, and there are a lot of sort of basic components that, um, that I uh, ask uh, my students to think about when they start to deploy their instrument. So one is um, how long will the instrument um, exist um, will there need to be sort of a durability or wearability factor to it? Um, two, where will it be deployed? Um, three, who, of course, um, storage, will that um, data need to exist on the instrument or sort of um, fly away into the cloud? Um, and then processing, um, will the data need to be processed on the instrument or fly away? The crowd. Um, this is an image of a, a military system for um, for monitoring um, vital signs of, uh, of soldiers, um, and I just thought that was very interesting. In that um, processing is sort of taking place everywhere, you know, because this is a very life and death si uh, situation. Um, there's pretty heavy duty processing on the individual, but then there's also processing. Um, on the on the tank, on the car, uh, you know, uh, a mobile command center, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Okay, so um, so that's kind of the overview of some quantified self type tools. Um, and um, um, going forward into smart cities and how can you make this data mean something in terms of urban studies, urban analysis, um, thinking about your town, um, your space. Um, as I mentioned, um, I kind of think of quantified self 2.0 as many people in time and space. And um, in a way, uh, the smart cities really is an emphasis on, um, on space. Um, seeing um, how, for instance, um, your stress level may correlate to areas where there are bridges and tunnels in your city things like that. Um, and so um, a lot of uh, sort of this process begins with visualization. You have a big bunch of data, um, you've geolocated or you've located it in some way. Um, now you need to sort of look at it. Um, and there are a number of uh, visualization types that are pretty common um, in the practice that I've been observing. Um, these are some of the types that you'll find on visualizing.org. And um, I find that some are more useful than others. For instance, maps are very useful. I also think that it's um, helpful to think about not just 2D, but also 3D visualizations. Um, here are some other, uh, here's another image of the type. So, so in terms of two-dimensional visualiz visualizations, you usually think of sort of um, geographical maps. Um, for instance, chloropleth maps that show distribution um, of, of a certain a phenomenon over space. Um, a lot of uh, what we do in, in our practice is dot distribution. For instance, you're wearing a sensor or you have a sensor on your vehicle that's moving in space that's collecting data once every second or every minute. So then you have a bunch of dots. And so um, from there, you, you sort of map those dots out. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, we don't th use this so much proportional symbols, but um, it can be really effective if you want sort of a fun way to indicate, um, indicate some kind of phenomenon that's understandable very quickly, for instance. Um, I could see this being used for, um, like this is an example that's not quantified self so much, but maybe if you were quantifying a cow, um, you can use this um, for, you know, for instance, and, and put a methane sensor in your cow, you could use this same kind of visualization for um, a quantified cow project. Um, <laughs> so um, right now, um, one of my goals um, in um, future sort of areas, uh, or future sort of, sort of studies of quantified self in smart cities is to explore more, uh, more of a three-dimensional realm. Um, this is, uh, um, and I have a, a background as a scientific visualizer, so that's kind of part of my agenda. Um, this is a visualization of how water um, moves in the brain. Um, and so a lot, of, um, a lot of what's available to, um, to people working in this domain are um, CAD software, computer-aided design software. So for instance, um, Rhino, or um, which is open source, or, or it's uh, free. Um, SolidWorks, um, you also have um, Circuit Design, CAD, um, and um, what I'm really interested in is sort of um, exploring uh, more uh, spatial, geospatial, you know, actual uh, multi-dimensional um, data um, in multi-dimensions um, on an XYZ plane. And so that's not something that we've explored too much, but um, I think it's worth mentioning just in terms of thinking how to effectively use and visualize and convey um, this kind of data. Okay, so now it's time for some tools um, and examples in terms of visualization. Um, so these are some of the visualization categories um, that um, I sort of go through in the process of visualizing any kind of data. Um, particularly um, data that I've collected myself or you know, that, that, uh, that I know uh, from a collection that I know. Um, and then here are highlighted in turquoise are the open source and um, maybe more open source less, uh, uh, I didn't really highlight the, the free tools. Um, and one thing that I, I think is notable and for any of you who have um, experience with, um, with, with using um, uh, sort of building hardware, either 
from the electrical engineering domain or the mechanical engineering domain, is that there doesn't seem to be as much open source in terms of, of what tools are available, what CAD tools are available to people um, working with hardware. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what you think about that. I'm, I'm hoping that that's something that will change. Um, this is uh, an example of a very timeline-based project. Um, basically, um, this group of students was working to sort of quantify the sentiment of a bar. And so you can kind of see um, they were experimenting with the use of emoji. Um, and because this is a, a stationary project, they're looking at one location with the intention of um, expanding this project to other indoor locations. This is much more timeline-based. Um, and uh, I think that they, if I recall correctly, um, they used a number of JavaScript libraries, um, mainly D3. Um, so this is what I was talking about in terms of um, dot distribution um, being a very common way um, that we visualize um, the sort of quantified self data. So on the left um, is a project that used um, uh, a brain sensors um, on uh, subway riders. And sort of looking at the most um, the the most unpopular. So in New York, there's um, an organization called Strap Hangers, and they rate the different subway lines um, for most rideable, most rider friendly, and least rider friendly. So this group um, looked at the most rider friendly and the least rider friendly lines um, using uh, EEG, um, and you can see um, where. Um, and then they annotated, so this was one of the least um, rider friendly lines, and then they annotated um, things that they were exer observing or happening um, in conjunction with um, the mental experience. Um, so the uh, red indicates levels of, of, of high attention. Um, on the right is um, a, a pulse map, basically um, uh, the instrument was um, tracking um, pulse, um, and then uh, uh, three, um, three students were walking around Brooklyn and Manhattan and sort of um, looking for um, uh, patterns between um, individual pulse and environmental change. And one of the things that they found is that, you know, while pulse is an indicator of many kinds of things, it can be an indicator of exertion, it can be an indicator of stress, um, one thing that did seem to be consistent is that when there was a very uh, rap, a very sudden change in sound um, in the environment, say um, you, you heard a construction um, start or the room suddenly got quiet, there was a, a, a change in pulse, and so that was sort of, it's sort of like their working um, uh, uh, their working observation that they'd like to explore more. Um, and then finally, um, the uh, the lower right is a map. All of these um, color palettes are very similar, um, but they're all looking at different things. Um, so the last map is a, a map of sort of the quantified car experience. Um, a bumpiness meter was attached to um, a car, and with the intention of, um, of uh, making a map of potholes of New York, sort of a real-time map of potholes, and sort of um, a map that can indicate to DOT and other agencies um, what the priorities are in street repair. Um, this is a, um, um, a visualization from a group of students who was working with um, with uh, with uh, spectral cameras, and um, what they were looking at was um, levels of blue light in a room, um, and as well as um, levels of um, of incandescent light, so warm light, more um, wide spectral light in a room. And so what they were doing was looking at that um, with uh, keeping in mind um, some studies that they had read that blue light um, can uh, be, or excessive exposure to blue light can be associated with depression. And, um, and that, um, but at the same time, blue light um, is more efficient. Um, so what they're showing on the left is um, sort of a depression level for the room as well as a, an efficiency level for that room, all based on sort of a color spectrum. Um, and uh, I'll move on from there. Um, so I, I actually did want to talk a little bit, if there's time, about the tools that are used to make some of these things, um, if there's interest in sort of talking, breaking down the tools. Yes, ish. Okay, cool. Okay, so. Um, 
So all of these, um, it's interesting because the urban studies students um, that I work with, um, the uh, package Tableau is very popular, which is uh, not open source at all. Um, and I, I think that's very interesting. All of these visualizations um, are made in Tableau, but at the same time, they could be um, made with open source software just as easily. So I'd love to get your, your opinion on that. Okay, okay great. Thank, Thank you. Everyone.